that, yeah. Thank you very much. No no, 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 no. Wait till you hear the talk, then decide if you want to clap. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, President, rather, uh, Clave, and especially to all the students we interrupted today to interrogate about their reasons for being at Harvey Mudd. Um, you were all very on message, which was good. Um, seem to be doing interesting things and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'm, my name's Mike Shaver. I've been working in software for about 20 years uh, and doing something resembling management for about 15. I'm currently at Facebook, where I'm a director of engineering. Uh, I spent a lot of my time at Facebook working on mobile, including the sort of big transition of Facebook from having, having a mobile app to being a mobile company. Prior to that, I was at uh, Mozilla for six years, and for a meaningful chunk of that, I ran engineering for Firefox, ranging from the core web technologies through to product management, uh, security, localization, developer support and so forth. Um, when I took over at, uh, at Mozilla, a week later, Google launched Chrome, uh, which was sort of a change in our, our environment, right? The, for us, the, the industry had grown, right? And nobody really honestly wakes up in the morning and says, I really hope Google competes with me tomorrow. Um, but it turns out it can be survived, and, uh, and we were definitely stronger for it. Um, I've I've been had I've had the the uh, good fortune of being part of a or, bunch of different organizations as they grew and they grew in a different bunch of different ways. One of the things I've learned about myself, and I, I share this um, 
not just to keep you from hiring me into the wrong role, but so you understand the perspective I come at leadership from is, I'm much more excited by transformational leadership than operational leadership. I think once, if you have a system that works and you need someone to make sure that is operated well and so forth, I'm not your guy. Um, but I do get a lot of energy and satisfaction out of helping organizations, uh, helping organizations grow, helping them, as I, as I say, find their natural shape. The configuration of people, processes, communication, tools, that makes success be a downhill journey for them, uh, for that organization, and similarly for the people within that organization and beyond it and sort of the ecosystem around, that the company can create an environment that is satisfying, that provides growth and challenge, uh, and honestly that brings joy into people's lives. We talk about the work-life balance, but I think the more we can keep that from being attention and the more those can be additive to each other, uh, the more satisfying we find everything to be. So um, growth takes a lot of different forms. I'm going to talk about a couple of them here. Um, and they manifest differently for, uh, for organizations, but they, in my experience, have a lot of similarities in terms of uh, ways to manage through them. So the most obvious and sort of initial one is team size, right? You manage or you lead a group and of N people, and now it is a group of 2N. Um, and so uh, some things about your role change, some things about the way the team fits together change, and that's, that's sort of an obvious one. Um, another is where the organization around you changes. So rather than your fish growing, the pond grows. Uh, and that, again, changes a bunch of things about how you operate and change the context in which you lead. Um, the last one that's up here around contact surface is actually one that I experienced uh, for myself at Facebook. When I arrived at Facebook, there were about 30 people who worked on the mobile applications and website. And they were responsible for everything that was in those apps. So if someone on the groups team went and added something to the groups app, to, to groups on the website, we had to go and make sure it worked on the, on the mobile apps as well. And there was technology to make that easier, but ultimately that's where that responsibility was. Over the course of about two years, we transformed to everybody at Facebook in the engineering and product space working on the mobile apps. The people doing photos were responsible for that aspect and so forth. Um, and that meant that for us, while the team hadn't grown a lot, it did grow, but while the team hadn't grown a huge amount, the contact surface with the rest of the organization changed dramatically, right? Where we used to have a small number of relationships with individual engineers or product managers, we were now connected to every part of everything. Uh, and it meant that we had to change how we operated, we, the, the sense of what leadership meant, not just within the organization, but by, that, by our part of the organization, changed pretty dramatically. So growth is great, right? I mean, Gordon Gecko would tell you greed is great. Um, he's a jerk, but I'm a nice guy. I'll tell you growth is great. Um, and it provides a bunch of opportunities, right? Uh, people like growth as a sort of a sign of success, uh, but it's also, it also does provide a bunch of opportunities as a leader to improve you know, your lot in life and that of your, your organization. So um, as a team grows, as an organization grows, whatever form that takes, you have an excuse to rethink things. You can crack open the stuff you've been doing and reorganize it. So it may be that the process change you wanna make is actually not related to growth, but you get this nice sort of covering fire for doing those kinds of things. You can say, hey, now that we're 10 people, we should really consider taking, min taking minutes in our meetings. It turns out that was always valuable, but growth puts people in a change mindset, and it's a valuable time to take advantage of that and look at ways that you can, you can improve what you're doing. Um, similarly, you can improve your structure, you can improve how you sort of devote your energy and attention. Um, this manifests all the time in software teams where you'll have enough people to build the thing you're building, and as you grow a little bit, you'll be able to invest in the tools that make that better, right? Or you'll be invest, able to invest in tools for sales, for HR, for finance, for customer support, where you can start to invest things on a longer time scale and in ways that give you this sort of force, mul force multipliers and leverage through your organization. Uh, and you know, initially, you know, as, a small, as a small team or a small company, you may just simply not have the cycles to devote that way. But as you grow, you get an opportunity to think in a little bit of different time scales and at different ways of investment. And to me, the most exciting part of it is an opportunity to develop leaders. Um, the, as a team grows, sometimes it's natural to sort of shard it or, or break it up and have other managers in, in place, uh, which can be good or it can be uh, sort of dangerous. But it's also an opportunity to develop leadership uh, of a non-managerial sort, right? As the scope of what a group does, as the scope of the company grows, as the scope of the organization, uh, it's, you create opportunities out of some of the communication requirements for people to take leadership roles in coordinating things. When I think about when somebody starts to sort of, somebody asked, I, I spoke to a class earlier and someone asked, you know, when, when did you first sort of feel like a leader? Uh, and I was like, this morning when I saw the slide up here. Um, 
But for me, the, the, the switch into leadership is when you start to be responsible for output that's not your own, right? You start to be, you've got goals you've signed up for, you've got commitments you've made, and no matter how hard and well you work, it can't be delivered by yourself. So you need to be recruiting people to your vision, you need to be making sure they have the tools to be successful, whether you're their manager or you're the senior technical person or you're the domain expert in some, some area. Um, those are opportunities to develop leadership within, within an organization, uh, and uh, that's one of my, actually my favorite piece of, of being part of a growing organization. Uh, but of course growth, you know, if it was really easy, I wouldn't have a talk, so I'm kind of glad there are some pitfalls here. Uh, and I made these all start with C, so I can now build like a nice management book kind of thing, the three C's of growth management or something. Um, I was very proud of that. Um, so as an organization changes shape, whether it's from growing or shrinking uh, part of an acquisition, something like that, you, you get strains on, on the organization, things that hold it together or are put under more stress, uh, things that used to connect don't. They manifest in a few ways. These are the, they're, and they're very, very much related. It's hard, it was actually hard to sort of tease these apart, but I mean, communication gets harder as you've got more people in the mix. You have more noise to go with your signal, you have more indirection of communication, you have more sort of the classic telephone game. One person might say, customer support is our top priority, and the next person hears customer support is our only priority, and if you're deciding what a team's gonna work on and where they're gonna invest, you can make very different decisions based on those things. And so the strain across that communication, because you don't have this really tight mesh across everybody, can be pretty perilous for an organization. Along with that communication issue comes often a loss of clarity. People have an idea of what they're about in the local reasoning for their team or their sort of set of teams, but they lose track of how that maps to what is ultimately success for their organization. So one of my favorite questions when I talk to a company um, to advise them is I'll ask a bunch of the different leaders or you know, individual contributors, what does success mean for your company right now? How will you know if you did a good job this half, like as, a, as an organization? And where you start to see that diverge, you see energy, you, you, you sort of, you have less velocity and more speed. You see all the same energy being devoted, but it's not aligning with other groups and it's not building towards the same set of things. Out of that also comes problems with consistency. And there's, I mean, consistency of communication, I mentioned, you don't want that telephone game, you don't want people uh, hearing different, you know, sort of hearing different instructions or hearing different, uh, different directions. But you also care about consistency of operation. You care about being consistent about what you're rewarding. You care about consistency of what kind of rules you're playing by. And some of these seem like uh, minor sort of administrative things, right? I, I say in my group that you can, uh, you know, you, anybody can sign for something under $2,000 and you say in your group they can sign under $3,000 and they're like, hey, why is this, this thing stuck between us? Why are we, these groups treated differently? But especially when you talk about what's gonna be rewarded, as a leader, and it's not, I mean, it's, it could be a bonus, it could be, you know, anything sort of like that, but it can also just be as much as attention, right? It can be as much, it can be as, as much as who gets some recognition in the team meeting, or who are you spending your time with uh, in terms of uh, developing leadership and who's getting that kind of investment. And as those things change, as one VP treats their team differently than another VP does, you get this shift in, uh, in context and you get this shift in understanding of how the company wants to operate, right? The, the, the mapping of values to action becomes inconsistent, and it makes it very hard for somebody to reason about how another part of the company is gonna work. It makes it hard for them to depend on, on what's going on there. And that leads to problems with trust. And uh, I think that the primary difficulty, the big challenge for an organization that's growing substantially is preserving trust. When you're a small organization, you can see inside everybody else's brain. You talk to them all the time, you know they heard exactly the same, same things you heard because you're all sitting in the same room. You know you have the same goals because all 10 of you agreed on this thing. You know how everybody's performing, you know how you interact with the rest of the world. As you grow, you start to abstract that. You start to lose the ability to directly understand and share the context that somebody else has. You stop talking about Jane, you start talking about the server side team. And then somebody will say, well, we don't talk about groups, we talk about people. And you'll say, fine, a person on the server side team is saying that this is what you've got to do. When, I, when you hear that as, as a, an individual, right, as a, an indiv a, pr a practitioner of yourself, you have to infer from that a lot of things. And if you don't believe, because you've seen divergence in the past or because you've, but you've heard different things, if you don't believe that they're steering by the same stars, if you don't believe that they're gonna be valuing the same things you value or they're gonna be building towards the same things you wanna build, then it's very difficult to be effective. It's very difficult to be all in, 
you start to play defensively with, against the rest of your team, the rest of the organization, and that's a really dangerous situation. As you start to play more defensively, you start to collaborate less, others start to play more defensively, you stop listening as well, and you end up with this enormous cost that's spent on keeping teams from working together, ultimately. Right? You, you look at the way these kinds of communication patterns manifest, you look at the way people decide to move or not move within the company, you look at the way people think about trade-offs between their own local situation and being good for another, another part of it, um, can come down to, to headcount, can, can be about who gets offices where, it can be who is dealing with what on the on-call cycle, or who gets to go and give a talk somewhere. Um, if you don't understand the context that people are operating in, if you don't have the ability to look at what they're doing and understand why, then you lose this trust and you lose the ability to trust in them to, to put, to get, you, you lose your willingness to take a dependency on them, right? And the reason you're all part of this larger team is because you can do more stuff together than apart or you would be eight different teams. I guess uh, you'd end up with like a team that was just a sales team that didn't have anything to sell, so it's a limit, it doesn't work. Um, though I've seen companies like that, to be honest. Um, but as, as a leader then, looking for places to repair trust, looking for way, places where it's falling down, looking for cases where the benefit of the doubt isn't being given, is a very powerful opportunity to make the growth process and the growth experience more comfortable and effective for the company, right? You, or I will say company. It applies to any organization. I have a background with nonprofits and, and schools and so forth. I've, I've seen this pattern in all of them. And again, these are the things that are sort of fighting against you. These are the things where you need to you know, reverse the vector. You need to start building these things back up and consciously investing in them because they're going to, left to their own devices, they're going to degrade on their own. And they're critical to making sure that the team operates as a team. Um, so there are some things you can do, I believe, uh, to improve your odds in this, right? Growth is a, it's a transformational thing. It means that the organization you're headed towards is not the organization you were. There is a risk associated with all transformation. So it may be that there is no amount of well-intentioned, good management that can get you through that, right? Companies die on growth sometimes. Um, but I think there are things you can do that will improve the sort of prognosis for these kinds of things and can make that process not only more likely to be successful, but also more satisfying and rewarding for the people who are participating in it, who are then themselves you know, under a bunch of strain. So I will read my slides to you now. Um, first one is to show your work. And I talked about how you lose track of why decision, of what, what motivates another team. Um, as a leader, it's easy for people to lose track of what motivates you and what, is, what you're using to determine what direction to go in. I say that the, I like to say that the why lasts a lot longer than the what. If I, if I understand what motivated a certain decision, if I understand what factors were considered, if I understand ideally what decisions weren't taken, what paths we didn't choose to go down, not only am I likely to be more comfortable with that decision, but I'm also in a position to make decisions that reinforce it and that build along those same values. Um, I talk a lot of the time about, you know, as a leader, I want to make as few decisions as possible. My role is to help, help people understand the values that we're gonna operate by, what success is and how they can contribute to it, and that they have the support to do great work, right? That they're gonna have the tools and the personnel and the you know, interpersonal support and growth to do those things. I don't wanna be making these decisions all the time. And as, you, as a company grows, it's very common that you had a set of things where it's like the scope for this stuff was one person and I made all those decisions. And obviously I did a very good job with it because we're growing, right? Um, but as those things, as that space gets bigger, you no longer have the ability to do all of those pieces by yourself and you need to be setting the terms of engagement for those kinds of decisions. So people know when they're faced with, do I spend time on customer support or do I spend time on software quality? Is that our only, is that our only priority or is it our top priority? One of the things that uh, causes problems in organizations when they're growing is perceived or actual loss of access. You're part of a small team, you hear how all the decisions are made, you chat with the CEO all the time, maybe she sits right next to you, you know everything that's going on. You feel comfortable, you feel like you're part of the team, you're included in all this stuff, and as you grow, necessarily, you're growing because there is more work to do and there's more stuff to understand, and that means it's not all going to be visible or even absorbable by one person, right? No one human can understand all of the software pieces that go into making Facebook. Um, 
even in that case, though, even in the case where you've got the ability to include people in some sets of decisions, you need to be careful doing that. Right? One sort of knee-jerk piece is there to say, hey, we're going to take all those 10 sort of senior people doing a little bit of management by low employee number, which is its own peril, and we're going to pull them in and we're going to ask them about this. We're going to have you know, a weekly steering committee or executive meeting, so senior leadership, and we're going to pull these people in and we're going to go down the list and we're going to make these decisions and they'll be part of it and they'll be included and empowered and they'll be motivated to help the rest of the company. But there's a trap. And it was with many things related to management, my eight-year-old daughter taught me this trap. So if I get up you know, from the couch at four o'clock and say, Claire, do you want to have pizza or lasagna for dinner? She'll say pizza, I predict pretty confidently. I'll say, great. But then I'll look and the pizza place is closed. Or I decide, actually, I'm not that into pizza today or... Um, the pizza guy says something that pisses me off. I say, okay, Claire, we're going to have lasagna for dinner. Well, now she's pissed. But if I just go to her at 4 o'clock and say, hey, Claire, lasagna for dinner, she's like, great, hmm, lasagna, back to the TV. No problem at all. I forced, her to take an I forced her to develop an opinion, and now she is stuck in it. And now I have to fight that opinion, even though to start, there was nothing wrong with the fucking lasagna. It's great lasagna. She loves it. If you put somebody in a position where they have to make a decision, where, they ha where you're, you're expecting them to have an opinion, where they feel like in order, to, in order to support and justify their own status in the organization, like, of course I care about whether we expand first into India or China, right? I'm a senior person at this company. I've been here, one of the founders. I've been here for, you know, two years, and, you know, since we were five people and working out of somebody's elevator. Of course I have an opinion about that. Shit, what's my opinion about that? I will pick something, and then I'm then and now as the leader, I'm making trying to make a good decision. If I'm lucky, it matches what somebody said, but you've got a large set of people, so good luck with that. More likely, I've now left this person feeling more disenfranchised than I did if I hadn't just just hadn't invited them to the meeting at all. So when you're going to include people, and I'm not saying you shouldn't you shouldn't you know you should sort of seal yourself off, um, but especially during these times of growth, as people's involvement in different kinds of decisions change and things sort of fall out of their scope, or more importantly, as they lose the context necessary to make these decisions, right? There was a time when so-and-so understood everything about how to trade off different customer requirements. Now that's split up by some different market segments, and that person can't keep it all in their head, right? They need, we need to make sure we can still make good decisions on that stuff. Um, you can still find ways to include people, right? Having people self-select who have their own who have opinions on this topic say hey we're going to have we're making some decisions right here's your sort of corporate weekly meeting we're going to making a decision right now about whether to prioritize development into india or china um and so and so is going to lead that decision people who have a strong opinion of that know what to do right it's to go like yell at that person until they're invited to the meetings and that's fine you that's that's sort of the inherent cost of decision making but if you can avoid pulling people into that whose opinions are going to distort um, and who you're going to put in a position to, to, be, to sort of force themselves into, to, sorry, you're going to, who you're going to bring in and force to take a position, you're in some trouble there. And you, you lose a lot of energy to that. And again, you, you, you make people feel more disenfranchised, make them feel more distant. Um, and that's you know, the opposite of what we're trying to do here. This was a trap that I, um, that I spent a lot of time in myself. So the fundamental attri attribution error says that you judge yourself based on your motivations, but you judge other people based on their actions. So if I write a memo to some, about something and it's a little bit offensive, I meant well, I was trying to do something good, I made a mistake, but I'm a good person. Maria writes a memo that's offensive, she's a jerk. Because obviously what she did is what she intended and the outcome she got is what she wanted to have happen. That particular form of inferring belief and values from specific, often decontextualized activities is a brutal, brutal trap. It's a trap for leaders during all stages of an organization. It is especially a trap during, gro during growth periods because people are going to be doing new things in new ways all the time and you will not be able to always match your traditional patterns of action to value against people in new configurations who are learning their jobs or where you no longer have all of the context. And you'll need to watch for this in the teams that you lead as well. They're going to abstract away what people are doing. They're gonna say, you know, finance doesn't care about how much of a pain in the ass it is to file expense reports, whereas like finance is trying to keep somebody from going to jail because we now, offer, we now operate in another market and their financial requirements, are, their reporting requirements are different. Um, 
those kinds of those kinds of uh, of things that that show a de that uh, sort of fabricate a detachment from values. Right? There will be real detachment from values as you grow. Things will drift apart, and you need to pay attention to that, and you need to call those things out and act on them. I'm not saying that, that those won't be there or you won't detect them this way, but you will get a lot of false positives through this mechanism. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the trickier things about uh, navigating changes in values is, changes, is how those things affect hiring. Um, and I have a, a sort of bee in my bonnet about a, a bunch of issues related to diversity in tech, the tech industry, um, which is in a terrible state. Uh, one of the things that happens as teams grow, one of the ways that they, those parts of the company diverge is how they evaluate candidates, what kinds of things they ask them, how they weight the relative performance of systems design versus algorithmic work versus you know, professional background versus reference checks, how much process they put into that, to what extent they try to blind things or not for, for purposes of, uh, and even just where they look for, for candidates. Um, and those are the kinds of value differences you need to really get on top of. Things that look like somebody might be deciding in a different way how they, who sits nearest the window, probably does not have a big values component to it. But especially where, where, you're, where you're making decisions related to who's going to become part of the tribe, um, those are places to be very sensitive to it. There was a previous uh, Annenberg uh, speaker who talked about following and leading and how those things work together. Um, and I'll confess I haven't watched the video, but I'm sure it was excellent and did a better job than, than I will. So I'll keep this part pretty brief. Um, while you're leading your part of an organization, you need to be following the rest of the organization. And I don't mean to do that blindly, right? I've already talked about the, the need to keep stuff coherent and the need to push back on things that, that shift the operation of the organization outside of its values. But you also need to sort of pick your battles, right? If, if three of the four teams have decided that this is how they're going to present their summary reports, they're going to stick it on the wiki somewhere, they're going to email it out in this format, Maybe it's not optimal. Maybe it's not the way that your group's work shows off the best. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't die on that hill, right? Uh, on the other hand, if someone, if another, if a, uh, if you find another, you know, another group again on the, you know, to harp again on hiring, if you find that a group is evaluating candidates, that they're valuing things, that they are, you know, discriminating in some way, um, and not necessarily even in sort of the obviously like problematic ways, but around whether somebody's had you know, enough experience, you know, four years versus six years, or they came from Microsoft, so they must be really sort of high bound in process, these kinds of things. Um, those are important to go and push back on. But in a lot of cases, you're gonna wanna follow because the place that, that, that the action that people take are going to determine what actions are available to you, right? And you're gonna have to live in the negative space of some of the other teams. And by figuring out how you, by, by actively, sort of actively following, by, by being proactive in how your team relates to other teams and in sort of the space it stakes out for itself, you can create more of those leadership opportunities, for example, that I spoke of earlier. You can create structures and channels that help you make sure your communication match your values. Um, but while you're in this leadership role, you are the focal point of this tension between what's good for your team and what's good for the broader sort of corporate organism, um, and managing that tension there, again, goes to communication, it goes to clarity, uh, it goes to consistency, and making sure that those things all match your values, right? And it goes to, again, um, showing your work, right? It goes to understanding why and asking why, not assuming you know, a given change is taking place. Is it intentional? Is it observed? Are we doing it to serve something? Did you just save the company from a big mistake? Um, understanding the what tells you a little bit, understanding the why of those things and bothering to go and, and pull those out, uh, those are, that, that's where you can, you can really make a big difference in how, uh, how an organization evolves. So uh, I want to say thank you. Um, uh, I want to say thank you to a few people. I want to thank my agent. Um, I want to thank the academy. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Professor Clave for inviting me to, uh, to do this talk. Um, I, I've had the opportunity in my career to learn mostly the hard way uh, about leadership in a bunch of different dimensions. And one of the things that I've, one of the few things that I'm certain is true is that leadership's a very personal exercise. Um, you know, as a, new, as a new leader, as a new manager, one of the challenges you often have is that you've only got one style. And that's great if that matches the needs of the team and the organization at the time. And usually, it do, often it does the first time because that's how you got picked. Um, 
but I've had the, the luxury, really, of being able to work with a lot of excellent leaders who have shown me a bunch of different styles there. And I recommend, I recommended to the, to the class earlier who were, who were sitting where you are now that they take advantage of their time at Harvey Mudd and, and as part of the community after that to really absorb a lot of the excellent leadership that's here. Um, so thank you for having me today to be uh, a visitor to your community uh, and coming today to, to listen to a little rambling about leadership and growth. And I'm more than happy to take questions should you have any. Yeah, so, um, so m it's a great question, uh, as, I, as I expected it would be. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so my Twitter bio says I've made 10 of the next six mistakes you're gonna make, um, and what I really sort of sell is scar tissue. So I will tell you about a case where I did that very poorly. Um, as I said, we released, uh, Chrome came out shortly after I took over managing Firefox, and. There were some things that Chrome was good at and some things that it weren't, but one thing it was really goddamn good at was being fast. And they were also very good at making that the, as the primary aspect in which people are going to evaluate browsers, right? They got to define the competitive climate entirely in like a month. It was amazing. Uh, I, have a, I enjoy thinking about it a lot more now than I did then, but, but it really was some pretty masterful. And then we spent the next you know, five years in what I think is probably the most competitive software environment that has ever existed between Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Mozilla fighting week by week to be faster at these things. So there were a set of benchmarks. Um, some of them were terrible. Did they still exist? Yeah, they actually had a browser then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, they, by that, but actually they have a browser now. They just buy, like, they had, anyway. Yeah, they were part of it. They were there, I remember. Um, there were, so there were a bunch of benchmarks. It was focused on JavaScript performance. And my background was JavaScript engine, so I got a little bit into the weeds, a um, little bit micromanagey, uh, which I do sometimes. Um, we said, hey, okay, these are, the, these are like, they're crushing us on these benchmarks. This is how long it takes, like 400 milliseconds to run this. We're going to get that down to 300 this quarter, right? This benchmark, we're going to get it down. And we get to the end of it. And, and at Mozilla, we used to have a goals processor, like once a quarter for two days, all the directors and VPs would get in a room together and we would talk about what our team goals were. And it was, at the time, it felt like a really pretty brutal process, but I actually miss it a lot because the amount of alignment you got on that frequency was tremendously valuable as the company was growing and then as it was under siege from, you know, the most powerful tech company in the world at the time. Um, and so we got to the end of the first quarter and like we hadn't moved the needle very much on what we wanted to move it on and so I was disappointed and I made my manager frowny face and I'm like this is, you know, we, need, we must redouble our efforts and then we redouble them again. Um, you know, we, these numbers need to go down, blah, blah, blah. We weren't really looking at like, people were, weren't sure how to move some of them specifically down so we backed up a bunch, right? Because I've been giving people instruction of like, move this graph from here to here, right? What could be, I'm telling you, a bunch of engineers, what could be simpler, right? Just be a little faster. Um, but it was hard because it didn't really empower people very well. They didn't get to make any interesting decisions other than like the, the low level technical ones. Uh, and they didn't really see how it fit into the big picture of why we'd be successful. So the next quarter, the third quarter, I wish it was the second, um, 
I revisited it. I went to the PR team and said, I want to know which three benchmarks are most widely reported by the press. Because what we have to do is not necessarily actually even be faster than Google, um, which is good. We have to take away their ability to market against us on performance. So we went and said, okay, I, like, I want to know which ones matter for purposes of our brand, right? There are tons and tons of benchmarks out there. We could make any of them faster. It's the nature of the beast. Which ones are going to matter? So we went and we found these top three. And so I went to the team and said, listen, here's the deal. We need to get to within 10% of Google on these benchmarks before we release, right? Or like we are in some pretty deep trouble. I said, until we are at 10%, until we've caught that point, I'm going to put people on this project anywhere I find them. It is going to be ludic ludicrously inefficient. They're going to be operating at like 10% capacity, but we will get some additional like scalar amount of return on their, on their effort, and it will move us a little bit closer. Because this was really, I believed, like the existential issue for us was browser performance, and that was going to be JavaScript performance. Um, so until we get to that point, everybody gets piled into this thing. From there until like a tie with Google, which I didn't think was going to happen, I said we're, just gonna, we're not going to put anybody on, but we're not going to take anybody off. After that, we're going to start taking people off once we're above, if we reach parity and we get beyond it. So it was interesting for a few, a few ways. One, people were able to tell like, what success was going to feel like. It was going to feel like Google not being able to, like these articles looking different about our browser and people thinking differently about what we had. It meant that they could be creative about what parts of the benchmark to attack and in what direction and what success was going to be numerically. We tracked ourselves against Google, which was much better than an arbitrary number from their VP engineering. And it was a pretty arbitrary number. It's like 400 is too big, so maybe we'll try 300. Um, but it also meant that as the market evolved around us, we could adapt. We got to a point, Microsoft released a new benchmark, um, and some people started to report on it. And so I said to the PR team, like, let me know if this crosses and this becomes one of the big three because we'll have to refocus our efforts. And everybody knew that's what was going to happen. So as, it became more as that became more important, we knew we had to pay attention to it more. Some people started to look at performance on it. It never actually crossed the line, which was good. Um, but we got to the point where like, we, we, hit, we matched Google in speed. We passed them for a little while. Um, we got into that leapfrogging week by week thing. But I really think we wouldn't have been able to do that if I had kept people locked into the what of my decision, of the, where this benchmark is going to run this fast. I explained to them the why of, of that kind of investment, and that means I recruited sort of their whole selves into meeting that goal. I'll do a try a shorter answer this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's a very sensitive thing for a lot of founders. I think um, one of the most important things to do is to tease apart leaders. It needs to be clear to people who are primarily technical contributors who may not be good managers or may not be interested in man being managers that they can continue to have and grow in influence in the company without taking on management responsibilities, right? And so that can involve mentoring of other people. It can involve, you know, some being technical leads for different kinds of groups. It can involve work that's more external. Um, there are lots of ways that somebody can take on a broader scope without managing people directly. The problem of bringing in external managers, right? So I've worked with companies where they've hired a whole lot of great engineers, right? But they haven't really invested in finding good managers, figuring out a structure for them to communicate and grow. And I liken it to having a whole pile of muscle and not a lot of skeleton, right? It's great, but you can't climb very high that way. Um, when you're looking to bring in an external manager, the, it's a very hard thing to interview for, right? There's a reason that like VP engineering searches take like a year or whatever craziness it is. Um, finding somebody who is excited about developing the technical leaders you've got and someone who passes the sniff test for those engineers as someone who will help them do that, who is not threatening but is enabling, is probably the best you can do. It, it's an error-prone thing, especially bringing in those first couple layers of manager because you don't actually know what management behavior you need in your organization. Right? You know you need someone to manage this team because it used to be two and now it's five and they can't all report to the CEO anymore. The CEO doesn't know what kind of manager they need, especially if it's their first, if their first, it's their first company. Uh, you're bringing in that first piece, there are no patterns to match them against, and that's where like reference and, and sort of what organizations have you been with is probably the most important test. But if you bring in a manager and you've never had, a, you haven't had explicit conversations with people about how they can grow in the context of there being another manager, 
I mean, it, it happens even if you grow a manager internally, right? One member of your five-person team is now a manager. Like, what the hell do the other four do, right? Does that just mean you didn't like me as much? You know, be clear that management is a different job, not a better one. Um, that it's a different set of skills and a different set of, you know, you're, you're measured on different things. And make sure that whoever you get in that role does believe in developing technical people um, as peers and beyond. Um, trying to think of an example I can give. PG-rated example, no. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Facebook. Um, when, uh, when I came to Facebook, Facebook was really good at shipping a website. I mean, I, I don't mean that in like a, a sort of diminishing sense. It was a very complicated and powerful and valuable website. But there are certain characteristics of that software where it's always up to date and there's only one version of it out there and it runs on your computers. If you have an error in it, it's like an error in one part, right? Some unit doesn't display properly, but the rest of the site still works. When you start to build mobile software, like desktop software, everything is different, right? It's gonna run on somebody's crappy phone you're never gonna have access to. That software is going to be there forever because some people don't update, some people can't update. And if something goes wrong with it, odds are good the whole thing is toast, right? It goes from my ad doesn't display or my birthday notification doesn't display to 10 million people can't start Facebook. Um, so all those things are terrible. We're asking people, it's like, hey, we're going to make software development more error-prone and higher stakes. How's that sound? Right? And so like, not a lot of hands went up around the room. But what we were able to do was to paint a picture of what it would feel like to use Facebook on a mobile phone when we had the whole company doing it. When Photos on mobile was designed and built and owned and pushed and imagined by the set of people who wake up every morning thinking about how, how photos connect people. Right, where our performance and network pieces were built and understood by the same people who've made these incredibly optimized networks inside Facebook's data centers. What it was gonna feel like when we could ship every two weeks, so you didn't have to wait forever for this mobile stuff, for you know, a mobile release to, to come out, putting people onto that cycle. There were a bunch of trade-offs. There's a bunch of, there were relationships I still work to repair from that time period. Um, but having people understand what the world was gonna feel like when we could do this, to imagine like, hey, what if, you could do everything there. What if we could do stuff that only makes sense when you're on somebody's phone, when you're on their camera? Um, uh, what's it gonna feel like to have that agency and that capability? And I mean, I could peel away, like, oh, well, what's keeping you from, from seeing yourself in that picture? It's like, well, I don't have anybody on my team who knows iOS. I'm like, okay, well, we can go fix that, right? We set up a training program. I sent 800 engineers through iOS and Android, not just engineers, we had recruiters go through. It's like, anybody can go through this, right? We're a mobile technology company now, knock yourself out. Um, finding out why, finding out Having them understand what the picture looked like and that we wanted them in it and that we couldn't be successful without them. In some cases, that like this is inevitable. Would you like to be on the right side of history? But mostly, like this is what we're trying to build and why. And then understanding what it was that kept them, like even if I recruited them to the vision, what made them willing, what kept them from being willing to commit their team and their credibility and their comfort to it. And those were things we could address, right? These, were, these are well-meaning people who want to build a great social experience for billions of people in the world, and I've said you have to change programming languages. Like, that's, that is small shit. But it's terrifying because it's at the center. And when you can get people to understand how it's going to be once you get over those things, and you can give them some of those tools, help them, help them in some cases see why they were... It's like, I don't know why I'm not comfortable with that, but I'm not comfortable. It's like, okay, well, let's go have coffee. And I'll come up with a bunch of reasons you might not be comfortable with it, right? Maybe I'll put some ideas in your head, but... Um, but we can come to something where it feels like they've got agency and they can move it forward. Um, and, and you know it's working when you start to hear other people selling your vision, right? When you go to these meetings and someone's saying, no, we can't do this to there because that's, it'll cause this. And I'm like, yes, you, exactly, that's you. And you give them a sticker or a hug or something, um, a beer. Uh, but yeah, that was probably, I mean, that's probably the best example I have of, of trying to get people to, um, to really buy in fully, right? To be willing to bet the success of a, and I, it's sort of a tangent, um, as though that weren't a big tangent. Uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done is change a successful company, right? Facebook had a fantastically successful business. It had, we had God knows how many people on our website. Um, we needed to change. We needed to be a mobile company, right? We needed to admit that the stuff we were doing wasn't going to work. Uh, and that's very hard, right? If, if, you're, if the company's in just dire straits, sure, roll the dice. What the hell? We're going down anyway, right? If you haven't found success yet, you're like, sure, we'll try another thing. We call it a pivot around here rather than like you know, sort of randomization. 
But when it's working and you need to say, hey, we need to take some, some effort away from this thing that we know and love and is working and put it on this other thing here that really sucks right now, to be honest. Like the whole experience of building mobile apps at Facebook was horrible. I don't know how that team, like, how that team managed to like, survive and stay at the company, and most of them are still there. Um, but yeah, getting, getting people to, to accept that that change was going to be there and see themselves in that picture was critical. I don't think we could have done it without it. Um, I mean, there were, there were a bunch of us. Uh, I mean, when I got there to, to run mobile engineering, I sort of felt like there was kind of a 50-50 chance that we'd be able to actually do it and have the whole company build together, or that we were going to have to build a totally, we're going to have to build a second Facebook company, right? We were going to have to have a photos team and a mobile photos team and a groups team and a mobile groups team, which is really defeat, but Facebook's a valuable enough business and mobile was important enough that maybe that's what was the path to take. Um, I mean, Zuck certainly saw very early on two things, I think. One was, right, that the graphs were going to cross around where our users were and where our revenue was. Um, you know, mobile, gross, mobile is where the growth was, and desktop is where all our revenue was, and we didn't have products. We, could, we, didn't, we couldn't build the Facebook we wanted on mobile. So he understood the business piece of it. I think he also understood uh, very viscerally how much more powerful Facebook could be as a part of people's lives if we really got mobile figured out. So I think it was, I mean, it was a business imperative, but it was also this enormous opportunity that he saw. And I think that combination let him be even, like, I think one of those, either of those pieces is like enough reason to do it, but the combination together was really inspiring as he presented it. Um, I mean, we had a bunch of VPs of engineering, we had people in the release engineering team, a bunch of people that I'd worked with previously at Mozilla even, who had built co consumer software. Uh, people, people got it pretty quickly. Um, we got to the how and not why, I think, pretty fast. Everybody saw that growth. Everybody wanted to be great on mobile. Um, we just didn't know how, what it was going to look like at first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm a, um, I'm a computer person, so like when I get into trouble, I add a layer of abstraction. Uh, and so I would say that the, the first piece is to figure out, there's almost always some inherent consistency available, right? People are doing different things, but they're doing things for the same reason, or they're doing things in reaction to, they're both doing something to fight what they see as a threat to the company, but they see, them as, they see the threats as differently. So to find some unifying characteristics there, um, and it's pretty rare that you can't. I mean, you, I guess I could imagine sort of it as a thought experiment that you'd have these totally unaligned behaviors. Um, the other thing, though, it, you know, especially in the context of growth, which is sometimes sort of unpleasant to deal with, is not everybody's going to make the, not everybody's going to like follow you around that turn, right? So the things that, that made somebody happy at and uh, effective in a company of a certain size or a company at a certain stage may no longer be there at 3x that size. And it's okay for those people to not still be there, right? It hurts because you, you, you did all this stuff together and maybe they're not happy about why they're leaving, but ultimately, like, if it's not a fit, it's not a fit. And so I look at sort of the consistency piece of that. First of all, I want to make sure that, um, that the, the inconsistencies that I observe between groups or between people uh, are manifesting because of actual differences and not just perceived differences, right? Do these people actually want something different or are they just hearing different versions of what the company wants, right? Is it a, is it a consistency issue or a clarity issue uh, of communication? Um, given that, I think that you, is it just me or is this mic going in and out? All right, all right, great. Um, given that, I, again, sort of my, my management and leadership sort of place of retreat is to roll back to values, right? Are the things we're doing, even if they're different actions, are they consistent with the values we're gonna, we're gonna operate by and the current set of goals? And it might be that like one group, it might be that one group decides to hire one way, another group decides to hire another way because they're responsible for different things and like the salesperson, the thing you want in a salesperson is different than someone you want in someone in HR, right? That, you can imagine a world in which that's true. Um, figuring out, so yeah, so figuring out whether those consistencies are, uh, are inherent or whether you, and, and then which parts of the consistency, inconsistencies are actually expensive to the organization. Right? There are going to be things that are just stylistic differences. This team you know, gets two monitors, whatever. Um, there are other things, again, especially around hiring, where you really want that to be together. 
Um, but this is, a, this is a case too where if you, if you sort of map out how those inconsistencies are, if you find people that want to behave in one way and people that want to behave in another, that may be giving you a signal about a better organizational configuration or a better way to express and, and manage goals for those sets of people. And I've seen that before where you have people, it's like, oh, I really, you know, they're really interested in building systems-y stuff and they think about APIs all the time or they think about how other people are going to use it. You have other people that really want to build like a product and really work on the UI and sometimes they're not aligned and not distributed in a way that matches that. They used to be because they were part of one team and then we grew and we split them across what looked like pretty reasonable axes, but you see inconsistent behaviors because they're not equally sort of well-suited to their current framing. And so a little bit of shuffling can help that sometimes. Um, let me see if I can remember all those questions. Uh, so here's my favorite, like, uh, look, I've got two localization sort of related stories, one of which is from the mobile app, one of which is actually from my time at Netscape. We built a mail client as part of the grand Netscape software experiment. Um, and one of the things we did in one release was we, made, we wanted to make it easier to tell if you'd like already CC'd somebody in something and manage that list a little better as it got longer. Um, so we said, oh, we'll just sort that that list so you can easily tell if somebody's already copied on it or whatnot. So that's cool, we ship that. Um, well, it turns out that uh, in Japan, I believe, the order that you are in that list, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, yeah, so, so we had to roll that back and that was a case where something that seemed to be purely algorithmic turned out to have like an analog human component to it. Um, Working on the Android app at, uh, at Facebook, we built a custom camera flow for taking pictures and tagging them and stuff. It was great, it was great. Uh, and when you like, click the button, we played, the, we played a little sound, it was perfect, except we played the sound through the normal mechanism and that meant it honored your volume switch. And again, in Japan, if you take a picture, you've gotta make a noise by law. So uh, Android and iOS both have these special calls which are like, make a sound for a camera and they work regardless of what your system volume is set to. So again, we discovered that by shipping it and having someone call us at an ungodly hour and say, hey, this thing you did is like breaking the law, maybe by the way, in a major, maybe you could, yeah, so we fixed that too. Um, this is how we learn things, uh, one, offending one major culture at a time. Um, one of the challenges we have around, so and I'll, I'll say like, prior to, to Facebook when I was at Mozilla, uh, it might have been the most widely distributed engineering organization in software. Um, I had 250 people in my org. 25 of them were in the same office as me. A total of 35 were in the same time zone. Um, within two layers of management, I had people in all but two major time zones. Um, uh, and having, I worked briefly on calendar software before that, so I understood it was an impossible problem to actually schedule things, but it didn't really improve my like, visceral experience with it. Um, you can know things but not feel them, you know what I mean? Uh, and yeah, we learned a lot. We, I think it, there were a lot of things about that, that sort of structure that were expensive for Mozilla, but um, one of the things that was very good for us was our ground game. We had people who were experts about the web and experts about our product and experts about how you talk about these things in Hungarian. You know, what it means to have something, you know, pop up in this color in Saudi Arabia. Um, actually, I don't think I had anybody in Saudi, but um, those, uh, those kinds of things, you, you can get them through, you know, we do, trans we do like crowdsource translation basically on Facebook. There's a you know, site people go to and translate strings for us, and it's good. And sometimes we leak product information that way, but mostly it's fast enough that it's fine. Um, but we do have other stuff like when's Mother's Day. Every year we discover something new about when Mother's Day is because we show a happy Mother's Day thing in your feed to some set of countries and we discover one of them is wrong or we missed another one and so forth. Um, so as you do stuff that's more than just strings that has cultural significance, it's hard. And there probably is a better way than trial and error to do it, but I just haven't seen anybody do that uh, in my experience so far. That was, that was beautiful.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not universal. Sometimes what people did actually really matters, <laughs> um, right? Actions do matter. The, the risk there is sort of how you build your mental model of the person, and some of that goes to like what your future investment's gonna be in that relationship and what kinds of things you're gonna engage on them with, right? If I think you're an unapproachable asshole, then I'm probably not gonna do certain things that might be beneficial for both of us, versus if I think you're a, a nice person who's receptive to feedback. Um, the, having your actions more closely match your, your values, I think is almost always good. I wanna say always good, but I'm not really comfortable with absolute. Uh, one of the things I used to say a lot when I, uh, when I was managing at Mozilla, and still do sometimes, is I used to say I managed by two questions. I would ask, what did they ask, what did they say when you asked them about that, as a way to get around sort of passive aggression and attempts to indirect communication rather than like go and ask them about this thing they did, and then come back and tell me that they're idiots because they did it, but don't tell me that because you've talked to them. And the other was asking people, what outcome did you want? Right, I see something, I'm like, why would he post that? Right, you know, like, and, it's an open source project, all people say all kinds of things, they can't take them back, it's a mess, we all act like two-year-olds. Um, it's like, hey, what did you want to have happen there? It's like, if I really wanted him to understand how strongly I disagreed. Well, what he really understood was that he doesn't want to engage with you anymore, or there's no safe way out of this conversation now that doesn't involve him admitting he's an idiot, because that's the only path you've given him, is either stick to what he's doing or admit he's an idiot. Um, and so going back to that sort of focus, and I, have, I mean, I catch myself asking myself, my favorite, what were you thinking? Like, not just what were you thinking, but like, what were you trying to do? How would you have known if you did a good job of that thing you were doing right there? Um, being able to think about those kinds of, that kind of outcome, uh, and being able to, I mean, it's a useful question when you're going to sort of try and peel back some of that error to say, you did this thing, and I really don't understand it. What were you trying to accomplish with it? In a way that ideally doesn't sound like a really sarcastic framing. Um, in my experience, that's been pretty valuable. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I mean, some, sometimes uh, you pull the tablecloth out and not all the flowers are still standing, for sure. Uh, I mean, a company at any given time has a set of values, right? Ideally, they're explicit, um, and ideally, they're understood, but there are things that guide the operating principles of the company, um, especially the senior leadership. Sometimes the values do change, right? Uh, I mean, we think about values as being these sort of moral elements, but they're also really sort of prioritization decisions and uh, about the, what the goal of the company, why does the company exist? Being explicit about those changes in values can be fine, um, and it can actually be kind of energizing for people to realize that they're mutable and that they have, that it's, you know, that they could have a, a role in setting those values and helping determine what the company is all about. Um, you get drift from a static set of values when you grow. I don't know that the drift is actually worse when you've got a changing set of values. Um, you could get a little bit of it, but it's also an opportunity, again, is to just sort of crack that open and say, hey, we're growing now, we're now 50 people, we're now 200 people, let's, let's revisit what FUCO is about, let's make sure the company we are now is the company we wanna be now, and not just the company that we wanted to be two years ago, and let's make sure the things we're doing reinforce that. There's no substitute for explicitness there. There's no substitute for making sure people understand that these values matter and that they are gonna guide things. It's useful, I talked about sort of showing your work and talking about the why. Another aspect of that is to talk about the negative space, right? Here's what we're not gonna do, right? We are not going to do enterprise support, right? We are not, right now, our values are not reaching the most set of people. It's about providing the highest quality experience we can, we can provide in this, in, you know, of this kind of thing. Um, and talking about that negative space can, out, can be, make it very clear where a value shifted. It used to be about making whatever tech and teleportation available to everybody, and now it's like making sure it's really comfortable for bipeds. And that's what we're gonna focus on now, and you can talk about the nature of that change in a way that doesn't feel like you're compromising your values, but that you've learned and are, and are you know, adapting as a company. No pressure. So it's not really the last question. Like the last question for me. It's the last recorded. Sorry, we'll let you ask your question now. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, so I'll answer the second question first. You don't work in it all the time because it's fucking exhausting. Um, being in a change mindset means you're questioning stuff all the time. It means that you are being much more deliberate in a lot of cases with how you evaluate stuff. There are no shortcuts, there are no shorthands, you're not trusting pattern recognition. Um, and it's an expensive way to work. It's, it really is exhausting uh, to be in that state all the time. Um, I think, uh, sorry about your, about your, um, your first question, sort of an example of, of being in that, was about sort of an example of being in that mindset. Um, the, when, I, when I took over, uh, is Mozilla the example I'm gonna use here? Yeah, when I took over engineering at Mozilla, it was about 80 people, um, and it grew to about 250. And one of the things we had to deal with in that prospect, in that sort of process, was um, sort of a diffusion of technical responsibility. Uh, you know, it used to be that one person maintained the image library, and now three of them do. And so, like, am I three? Am I a third the status as I was before? Um, but putting that into a into a growth sort of mode, um, it's not always the case, but it's often the case, right? The person who was the sole proprietor of it before is now the lead. Um, and I got to express to you know Joe working on the image library that what he really had was two more smart brains to help you know realize his vision of what image handling on the web could be. Um, and turning that into his opportunity, but also his responsibility to figure out, how, like, like, here's what I'm giving you, right, is two other brilliant engineers who are motivated to do this stuff, who consider you the source of truth, so don't fuck it up, right? Like, go and make the most of this, and what coaching do you need, and what's success gonna be, right? I mean, I still, still his manager, I was just throwing him to the wolves, but, um, but approaching it from the perspective of, like, what's, What's the thing after this, right? We've put you in this new context, but let's focus on what you want it to be like to be the, the, you know, the, the lead for the image library in six months or a year. What do you want the experience to be like? What do you want your accomplishments to have been? And now how can we line up these new resources that we have in this new structure to make sure that we, we reinforce that? Um, not, everybody, not everybody goes for it. Not everybody wants that kind of change. I mean, there's still a technical role, but it's a little more indirect in a lot of cases. You find something else for them to work on. Um, or they go to another company and they are the only image of person there, and that's fine, right? That's a success thing. I want everybody to have the job they're happiest at. For some set of people in the world, they'll be working with me, and that's gonna be great. And if it's not, then they should go where they're happier, right? Life is too short to encourage people to stay where they're, they're distressed. Um, not that I won't try and fix problems and just really, you know, you don't cast people out like that, but sometimes it's just not the right fit, and that's fine. Um, and again, some people are not gonna make that turn. Some people are not gonna, don't wanna operate in a case where they have to explain their work to people. That's fine, it just means this isn't the right company for them to be at anymore. I hope that was resembling an answer for you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you.